All right, good afternoon, folks. Hi. We're about to start the last presentation of the day. Yay. Everybody claps. All right. So uh, my name's Dave Isles. I'm a senior director with uh, Mellanox Technologies. And I've been doing networking since, uh, uh, I guess, the 1980s, which makes me kind of a gray beard. And there's one thing I've learned in that time is um, never get in the way of the after trade show drinks. So I'm gonna promise not to go too long here. But I'm gonna to talk to you about Sonic and how it's ready for 400 gigabit ethernet and 200 gigabit ethernet. And um, not just about the fact that we have it running on our switches, but it runs better on our switches. So first off, who's Mellanox, right? A lot of you folks may not have heard of us, although we've been in the news a lot recently, right? Um, but you know, the short answer is we are a networking company that is laser focused on the data center. We don't do wireless LANs and we don't do you know, routers. We are focused on connecting servers to servers and servers to storage. And we are in the largest data centers of the world, meaning we supply nine of the 10 top hyperscale accounts. We are in all of the automotive accounts. We are in most of the oil and gas accounts. So we're in all of these uh, accounts. Why are we in these accounts? A big part of it is our dominant position when it comes to high speed connectivity. So, you know, we don't really play much in the one gig world, but as you start getting further to the leading edge, that's where we're comfortable. So we survive and thrive on the leading edge of data center technology. So if you were to kind of look at high speed networking, you said, hey, what, if, what is high speed networking? Well, it's, it's networking that's faster than 10 gig. And if you were to look at all of the NICs made by Broadcom, Intel, SolarFlare, Chelsea, you add them all up, we make more than all of those guys combined times two. So we're pretty dominant in this space. And a big part of why we're dominant is that we, we do things to make those servers more efficient. And so if we look at 200 gigabit, I want you to see this chart. This is the, the forecast, and it's looking ahead. Well, how are things connected? And one of the things you'll, you'll see is that 10 gigabit is rapidly shrinking. 40 gigabit's actually shrinking as well. What's growing? What's growing is 25 gigabit, 50 gigabit, 100 gigabit. We even have 200 gigabit adapters that we're shipping today. Now, 200 gigabit is exciting, but it's really for very few, very high performance server connectivity. So when I talk about 200 gigabit and 400 gigabit, what I'm mostly talking about is switch to switch connectivity. And so what I'm showing you here now is the, the, the forecast for data center optics, meaning these are optics that are less than two kilometers. So I'm not including the long haul optics where, yeah, some of this exotic stuff's gonna be very popular. And so one of the key takeaways that you're gonna see here is 100 gigabit is dominant right now. And it's dominant next year, and it's probably dominant the year after. But what might be surprising is that in 2022, you're gonna see more 200 gigabit and 400 gigabit than 100 gigabit in terms of revenue. So that's surprising. The other thing that might be surprising to a lot of folks is 200 gigabit. Why is 200 gigabit so big, right? If you, ha if you can do 400 gigabit, why wouldn't you just do 400 gigabit? And the way these things always work, it's a, it's a matter of dollars per gigabit. How much does these things cost? And in this case, I'm not necessarily talking about the optics themselves, which has a factor here. But if you were to look at a chip, a 12.8 chip, and you said, I can either build a 64 by 200, or I can build a 32 by 400 which are you gonna build? Well, if you're a really big data center, you actually might benefit a great deal by the higher radix of 200 gigabit. You might be able to build 100,000 nodes in three tiers and avoid those extra tiers in your data center by going by a quote, a slower speed and increasing kind of the value of that uh, interconnect. So that's a big factor there. And I think it was surprising for a lot of people to see 200 gigabit so dominant. So Mellanox, we uh, came out with a new chip last year called Spectrum 2. It's shipping to customers right now. And you know, it was built to satisfy the edge of that network. 200 gigabit, 400 gigabit, it's perfect for it. But more than just speeds and feeds, because in, in today's world, everybody's got a 12.8, everybody's got something that they're gonna talk about speeds and feeds. But we built this thing to have the best virtualization. So how many tunnels can you do? If you're doing tunnels, can you also route at the same time? Or if you're doing tunnels, can you also do Rocky at the same time? So better virtualization than the competition. 
We also looked at telemetry. So a lot of folks, they'll give you a lot of telemetry on their you know, enterprise class switch. But as soon as you start doing these higher speed switches, they kind of throw away the telemetry features. They throw away the virtualization features. And we're giving uh, guys that want to use Sonic all of these great features. And then last, we have the best in class buffer architecture and why this matters. So if you were to look at the PAM4, so PAM4 is what used for 200 gigabit and 400 gigabit, you look at the switches out there that are PAM4 and they're all, they're all multi-core. And now you server guys are going, oh great, multi-core, that's a good thing, more cores the better. But in reality, when you put a multi-core box inside of a switch, what you're really doing is creating a little network inside of a black box. And then the packets that go in, they might do strange things that you don't know about because it's a black box. So one of the obvious downsides to multi-core is that you orphan a majority of the buffers. So when you have a port that needs the buffers, they're not available. But there's a bigger problem, and this is one of those that's a, a poorly kept secret in the industry, is that you end up with weird unfairness problems. You end up with, if you can imagine in this scenario, I have one flow going through one of those cores, and I have a lot of flows going through one of the other cores. Why? I'm unlucky. Well, that one flow, that special flow, can be allowed to hog a tremendous amount of bandwidth. And this is a problem if you're doing Hadoop or Ceph, any kind of scale-out solution. Because the way it works is it doesn't matter when I get the first part of the file I ask for. What really matters is when I get the last part of that file. And so anything that slows down one member of that cluster slows down the whole cluster. But when you talk about cloud, there's another kind of um, uh, thought that says, listen, I have a, a promise when I offer a cloud infrastructure. My promise is that I've got all these tenants, and these tenants all have a, uh, they're using the same shared infrastructure. And my guarantee to them is I'm going to keep you safe from all the other tenants. That's my promise to you. And that, most people think about security, but you got to think about quality of service. If you have one tenant that's getting way more bandwidth than they want or than they deserve, you end up with a lot of unhappy uh, tenants. And so it's another problem with this multi um, core architecture. So let's talk about that picture there. So this picture is a pretty common use case for Sonic type deployments. What do I mean? A lot of smart Sonic guys figured out, I don't want to have multiple uplinks from my servers. What they want to do is say, I want to get rid of spanning tree. Because when I get rid of spanning tree, I also get rid of BPDU guard, loop guard, root guard, and every other little band-aid for solving that layer two loop prevention problem. They want to get rid of that protocol. And if they can go to one uplink per server, they also uh, don't even need MLAG. They can get down to like two or three protocols running in the whole data center, which is a good thing. Now, not everyone though can live with if I lose a, um, if when I want to upgrade a switch, I lose an entire rack of servers. A lot of people, that's, that's a problem because they have to deal with moving people around. And so what, if this was a commercial operating system, people would talk about what? In-server software upgrades. And as I mentioned, I'm kind of a gray beard in networking and I've been around a long time. I've seen ISSU and people put their, their NOS in a virtual machine and some people put it in container, but what I have seen in most cases with in-server software upgrades, and you guys that are network engineers have seen this, is it's very nice for demos, and it's very nice for security patches, but it's kind of unreliable for major upgrades. Most of the release notes for a major upgrade from, you know, pick the NOS vendor of your choice, there's always some little caveat that says, ah, we don't suggest ISSU for this upgrade. Why? because the SDK is being upgraded, the underlying firmware, or um, the ISSU code itself is being changed. They're going, oh, we're going to go this way, now we're going to change it. Or, and this happens all the time, there's some programmable logic that's on your motherboard, and you now need to reflash that programmable logic. All these things tend to break the commercial ISSU. And so, as I mentioned, we, we don't just do Sonic on Mellanox hardware. We think we do it better than everyone else. And, so one of the things with Sonic, uh, we wanted to have ISSU, and there was a multi-phased approach. And so we've got uh, this idea of fast boot, where we wanted to be able to reset the operating system in less than uh, 30 seconds. And so we're, we're at that point, and, and everybody's very happy. The second phase was to do something called warm boot. And this plays with BGP, graceful restart. It plays with a few things to kind of speed things up. 
And this is something that we can now demonstrate running in under 70 milliseconds. And we have this running at the show. Uh, we're happy to show a, a video of this running. But the holy grail of in-server software upgrades is to upgrade the software without dropping a packet. And the only way this works is if you've got the hardware hooks to pull that off. And so that's something you'll see from us later this year. OK. Other things that we're doing around telemetry. So telemetry is something that everybody needs. Even as the smart folks have figured out, I want fewer and fewer protocols running, they want more telemetry features. Why? Well, the number one reason is to improve time to innocence. Time to innocence is an important characteristic. So anybody that's been in networking for a while, you know that anything that goes wrong in the data center, people blame the network. And so then it's up to the network guy to prove, A, he didn't do it, and B, what the root cause is. And of course, there's other benefits, you know, like getting more out of your network and things of that nature. But if you're a network operator, your number one thing is, it's not my fault. So Sonic, we've been doing a lot to kind of improve the monitoring of Sonic. And so we've got all these um, resource monitors where you can monitor different things and collect tons of data and get it all streaming in here and streaming in there. But we would say that the right thing you want to do, you want to collect all that data, but you also want some event-driven telemetry that says, I set a, a threshold, and then I'll know if I want to start zooming in on one of these things. And, and I want an alert, and the alert has to be something better than a check engine light. Because anybody that's had a check engine light knows that I know, I just checked, the engine's still there. What you really need is something that says low oil light, high temperature light, and then you can go and drill down. Okay, lastly, because I'm gonna get the hook here, is we're also enhancing the other kinds of things you can do with Sonic other than just run BGP. So we have uh, another demo where you can run Sonic as a server load balancer. Because this is a very common use case where people are using any cast IP on lots and lots of servers and they let the network do the load balancing action instead of some expensive dedicated box. And we have with our um, Spectrum, not Spectrum 2, but just our current Spectrum running hundreds of thousands of uh, connections per second uh, with a VIP, load balancing to thousands of servers. So it's, it's a new way of using um, these guys. So key takeaways, as I, I again, I got the, the hook here, number one, Sonic is gaining momentum. So you're going to see us everywhere. Number two, Sonic's gaining functionality to make it more useful. Right? So you, you, you can use things like in-server software. The, the last thing, though, is I'd like you to, tr if you haven't tried Sonic, try it. It's free. right? You can download it. And I'll tell you one thing that's not on this slide. You ought to be looking for, thinking of Sonic as an opportunity. If you can imagine, Sonic becomes this pervasive NOS of the, of the mega data centers. And it's not locked into one vendor or another vendor. Think of the opportunity that is for you to provide things like better orchestration that works in anybody's hardware. Think about how this you can do more than just have a free version of BGP that runs on your hardware. There's a lot of opportunities in terms of telemetry, orchestration, bring up. There's all kinds of things you can do. So with that, that's my presentation today. Thank you, folks.